Hello everyone. I just want to welcome everyone to our African American Music Therapy. It is our pleasure today to have Brian E. Miller. Just a little bit about him is that he's a native of Kingston, North Carolina. He began playing the saxophone at the age of 11 in his home church and that's where his gift was first noticed. He's a graduate of North Carolina Central University of 2000 where he majored in jazz performance. He is the husband of Ty Miller and a father to three beautiful girls, Tyler, 13, Kyle, 8, and Adrian, 2. He is most passionate about allowing the love and light of Jesus Christ to show and shine through him at all times. He has been blessed to be able to perform and share stages with some of the world's greatest talents from Branford Marcellus, Frank Forrest, Foster Slide Hampton, and Clark Terry to Macau Parker and Kim Burrell. He primarily works with the John Brown Entertainment Group, and he had the pleasure of recording with them and being part of his debut album that hit number seven on the National Jazz Charts entitled Terms of Art, a tribute to Art Blakely and the Jazz Messengers. He has recorded with many different artists on their albums as a sideman and is looking forward to one day recording his own debut album sometime in the near future. With a roaring applause, welcome Mr. Brian E. Miller.
How's everyone? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on today. My name is Brian Miller. Um, as already stated, I am a native of Kinston, North Carolina. I do now live here in Durham, along with my wife and our three girls, as I so stated. Um, I am a professional musician. Um, the reason I don't label it as jazz musician or gospel musician or funk musician or R&B musician is because thankfully I've been blessed to be prepared to play in any one of those sectors. Um, so I am just, I say, a musician. Now I do specialize in gospel and jazz. Um, I got my roots playing in the church, which I'm still very comfortable with and also still do on a regular basis. I play for my own local church in Raleigh, uh, the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. And um, I've enjoyed doing that now for some 27 years. So um, music is definitely my life. It's the one thing that I, I, I have that uh, I can say no one can take away from me. And the great thing about being a musician and also playing professionally is that no one can play you better than you. You know, and that's not to say that people aren't better than you because there's plenty of people out here that, are, as I say, bust my head on music. <laughs> you know. But at the same time, you know, it, it also keeps you humble. But there's always someone right around the corner better than you. So, you know, it keeps, you, keeps everything in perspective and allows you to continue to want to have the desire to grow and to be the best that you can be. That first composition was entitled um, Donna Lee, written by the late, great Mr. Charlie Parker, also known as Bird. Um, he was one of the main influences of the bebop era, uh, Mr. Parker was. And uh, I did a tribute show to him down in Charlotte last year, well, year before last. Last year or year before last, where I did like a whole show full of just his music. And it was a task to get ready for, you know, because some of his music you know, moves quite a bit as far as the tempo, but also what we consider changes or the, the, the flow of the song itself, going in and out of different keys and things like that, and being able to play those and all keep them in line with what you're trying to do, as well as to make a musical statement as well can be very challenging. But uh, that tune was entitled Donna Lee. And uh, the next one I intend to play is going to be one entitled that has a like a little Latin feature to it. You know, feel free to get up and dance if you like. <laughs> but it's entitled My Little Suede Shoe.
little played too. Um, so now, this is the hardest part. You know, I can play the horn and feel, feel pretty confident. Um, this part is a little challenging for me. But now I have to talk. Although it seems like it probably comes naturally to me, which my wife would say it does, uh, <laughs> or my children. But um, this part is a little difficult because it's, 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 uh, sometimes I say things and it's almost like I have to say it to myself even as I'm giving it out to someone else, you know. Um, so I went to North Carolina Central right down the road. I came from Kesson, Kesson High School. Um, I, have, I was fortunate enough to have a very good set of band and music educators, you know, through my schooling. From middle school, well, actually from elementary school with Miss Pat Griffin, Patricia Griffin, who was a phenomenal pianist. I mean, she could play classical, she could play gospel. <coughs> Excuse me, she's a great piano player. Um, then I went to Rochelle Middle School, where my um, band directors were Mr. Arthur Harris, who's now deceased, and also Mr. Ernest Fleming. And uh, both of them were very, very uh, inspirational and, and influential in my progression as a musician. Mr. Harris, more so, and the reason I say that is because he taught me in sixth and eighth grade. But in eighth grade, I almost made what would have been, I would think at that time, a life-changing decision. I almost gave up music. Music wasn't challenging to me. I was playing in school. I was better than everybody else in the class. I was playing in my church. I was already being hired in the eighth grade to go play weddings for $100. You know, in eighth grade, $100, and I was rich, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, that, that was, you know, just kind of the thing it was. And, you know, I, I kind of developed an air about myself to myself in eighth grade. Well, coming from a family where your father's an educator, but he's also a past football coach, past basketball star, football star at North Carolina A&T University. Uh, Air Force, uh, Army. You know, my dad was he, he, he was a good guy. You know, and I was blessed to have him up until I was actually 16, uh, passed with cancer. But my dad, you know, being the stud he was, you know, hey son, you gonna play football? I said, well, dad, you know, yeah, I play football. And I love it. Don't get me wrong, I love football. But I love music more. It was just one of those things where it's probably kind of hard to believe. You know, you got a guy standing here now, 6'4", and I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh. Kind of <laughs> but I don't want to see your mouth drop your eyes too big. So, uh, but, um, you know, you, you, know you, you have a frame as small as mine, I'm going to say that. And then, you know, you're asked if you're going to play football, and it's like, that's just a common thing. You know, oh, he's got to play football. How many of you, by show of hands, when you walk in, you're like, he's played football? Okay. How many of you like, he's just a huge dude? <laughs> Fess up, come on. You know, I know better than that. More than two people? Okay. How many of you like, he's the skinniest dude I've ever seen? <laughs> no hands. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you all. I see bigger. Okay, okay. <laughs> but, you know, I say all that to say, you know, there were expectations. You know, there was, there was a, certain, a certain path that the general public kind of had planned for my life. Not necessarily that it would have gone on to NFL dreams or college dreams or what have you, but it was an expectation from those outside of my household. You know, my mother knew that I told with it quite a bit. My father knew that I told with it. You got one side being the youngest son, you want to deal with what dad's doing, you know, but at the same time, you want to make mom happy because mom doesn't really want you out there because you're a baby. I'm the youngest of three kids, and uh, mom just didn't want me out there. You know, so I had to deal with that. So, decisions, you know, then that was sixth grade going to eighth grade. I played football in middle school, was in the band. Now comes high school, you got to decide. Marching band, because you have to be at the games and march, or football, you know. So ninth grade at work, Thursday night playing JV, you can still march the game on Friday, go to do the show, and then you can go to competitions on Saturday. Well, that was in 12th grade, because I took 10th grade off, just did music only. 11th and 12th grade are what 
changed my mind to let me know that one, it was okay to stand alone. It was okay to be my own man. I didn't have to live for dad, I didn't have to live for mom. I could live for me. And they were going to love me regardless. They were going to support me regardless. They were going to embrace my decision. Whether they liked it or not, they were going to embrace it. Why? Because it was me becoming my own and being able to think on my own. So I decided that I wasn't going to play football in 11th grade. I decided I was going to go totally to music, hands down, no question. Don't ask me in school if I'm coming to practice. Don't ask me if I'm going to do two a days in the summer. No, I'm not going into that. I'm going to be in the house. I'm going to listen to my radio, playing from the radio, or I'm going to be playing in church when revival comes, or I'm going to be playing this wedding for whatever family member or whoever in my community is getting married and wants a saxophonist. And that was my decision. Well, eighth grade, before I made that total decision, I was going to give it up. And Mr. Max, Mr. his name was Maxwell Harris, Arthur Maxwell Harris, and my dad called him Max. And uh, Mr. Harris told me that I had told him I was going to give it up. You know, I was just going to go ahead and play football for my four years when I got to high school. And Mr. Harris, with tears in his eyes, he told me, he said, boy, he was, a, he was a good family friend. He and my dad had gone to school together. He said, boy, Carl and Mary put too much into you, with my parents, of course. He said, they put too much into you. He said, and you got a gift, boy. I'm like, you know, Mr. Harris, yeah, I got a gift, you know, and I, and I appreciate, you know, I, I want to play music, but I can play in church, and I can just do that. And he said, yeah, but playing in church, he said, that's just that side. He said, man, you got to get you doing things in church that people don't do in church. He said, now you're making it work, but it's not what people generally do. He said, you're playing a different way. There's, there's something to your playing. You've been given a gift. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know. And he, I mean, like I said, he was a waterhead. So he's crying like crazy. I'm like, you know, what is really going on? But at the same time, when somebody's that passionate about something they see in you, it makes you wonder what you know, what lies to me, what is it that maybe I don't see, you know? And so I began to think about that, and I began to try to channel that, and the more I kind of gave into that, or kind of, you know, accepted that, the better off I was becoming music, you know? The more things I was realizing, yeah, this person over here is playing in their church, but they're not doing what I'm doing. This person here is playing for this person's wedding, but they're not able to play like I play. Now it's not a thing of a, an arrogance, it's actually more of a humbling thing because I realize I've got something that everybody doesn't have, you know. And I, I, I say all this, I'm building up to each one of you have the same thing. Each one of us have something internally that neither any one of us else has, you know. And it's up to us to bring that out. Our decisions determine when that's going to come out or if it's going to come out, you know. I don't know. Let me say this thinking as in a community college, I would think if you thought like me when I came out of high school, I was like, well, I make it go to a community college and go ahead and get my core classes and stuff out of the way. Then I can go and transfer, just take my major courses in, you know, the, the regular institution. Another option maybe for some of my some of my uh, for myself and some of my friends may have been, well, I'm not going to school right away. I'm going to go work first, you know, whatever circumstances you may have. Mom and dad may use the help. Maybe I just want to have some money before I get ready to go away because I know I'm going to go out of town and, you know, go, maybe go out of state. I'm going to have an increased tuition or whatever at this other university. Some it could be a second chance. It could be, well, I tried something else and now I'm coming back, you know. All that leads to where you are. I'm not the most religious or spiritual person in the world. But I will say this, I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe that there is a divine plan and a divine route for every one of our lives. I believe that my route that's gotten me here required me leaving my hometown, which now, if you pay attention to the news, Kenston, North Carolina is on the map. It's not a good thing. Every time you turn around, somebody's getting shot, somebody's getting killed, somebody's getting stabbed. It's not what I grew up around. It's just not that. But 20 some odd years ago, had I not left, any one of these news reports coming out today would have been me. You know? I say that to say 
regardless of your situation and where we are now, don't feel like it's not by design that you're here. It's definitely by design that we're here. We're all even in this one space for some reason. It may be for what I'm saying to you, I don't know. But it could be for something that you may say to me later. Who knows? It could just be to introduce you to jazz. It could be to let you see a live jazz performance. You know, I don't know. But I realize that my path in life, every, I needed every single thing. Even down to the passing of my father. I would love to have had him here. But at the same time, in my father's passing, it's motivating. You know, one, because now is not a thing that I have to live in the shadow of my father, but it is something that I got to take care of my mother. You know, I look out for my mother. My father told me on his deathbed, he said, look out for your mother. Now, that came hard for me. You know, I'm the youngest son, but that came really hard for me. My father told me to look out for my mother. So I took that and I ran with it. You know, I look out for my mom. My kids love my mom. My wife loves my mom. My wife doesn't hinder me from doing anything in the world for my mother, you know, which I'm very thankful for. That's a blessing. You know, my mom is up here almost every other, if not every other weekend, every other other weekend, but it's not to see me. Like I said, I got three daughters. The grandbaby come first, please. But, um, you know, our choices in life, and I, I, I ramble, I'm sorry. I may be here and I may be there, but I'm sorry. I told you this is my heart. But, you know, the, the, the the choices we make in life determine our future. The choice you make today is going to determine something that's going to be tomorrow or in the years to come. When we begin to think like that, we begin to develop a plan. We begin to develop a process. Uh, a, 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 we begin to develop what's called our, our will to either succeed or to just kind of, you know, go with the status quo being the norm. Okay? I decided I was in college. Hey man, you wanna go to the party? It's homecoming week. Nah, man, I'm not gonna go out this time. Man, you don't ever go out. But I'm in college making money because they're home right there. You know, I was on full scholarship, but I was in school being able to make money. You know, and so that was a good thing for me. You know, that was a good thing. And it also kept me out of some things that later on my friends ended up getting into, like children. Which is not a bad thing. But in college trying to get your education. You know, you're either going to focus on being a parent or you're going to focus on being in school. Or, if you have done that and now you have a child, now you have a greater focus because you have a focus of being a parent while being also a student. You know, and that can be done as well. You know, but you have to make the choice. We have to make choices in order to get where we want to be in life. There are going to be obstacles. There are going to be naysayers. There are going to be people who say or who said, Man, you're not going to be able to do that, playing music. You're not going to be able to do this. Man, you got to be in the right place at the right time. you got to do this, you got to do that. You're not going to be able to, you know, uh, man, you're not going to be able to probably afford a mortgage. You're not going to be able to have kids because, you know, musicians struggle. You're going to have a hard time eating. <laughs> okay. You know, so needless to say, I proved that part wrong. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm really thankful, you know, because all that motivated me. You know, my brother is a principal in Guilford County. He's a principal at a high school in Guilford County, up in Greensboro. And one thing that he said was his driving force was one of his eighth, his eighth grade math teacher told him because of how much he played in class, not how much he did his work, or not how much he didn't do his work. She told him that he'd never be anything because he never took anything serious. Now, we are revengeful people in my family. But as soon as my brother got his principalship, you could believe he was the first thing in Kenston looking for the math teacher to show him and show her his degrees, show her that he's become now a principal, show her this, that other. He's also shown her now how his school, thankfully, has accelerated or actually have boosted their scoring grades by over 60% since he's been there. This is his, going into his sixth year of the principal there. So, you know, it, it, our decision, you know, whatever you use to motivate you. For some, it may be a, a family, it may be a child. For some, it may be, you know, the, the desire of a, of a loved one to pass. For some, it may just be your own internal thing that says, you know, I got to do this because nobody's going to do it for me. My daughter just got a progress report on Friday. And the only thing I could tell her was, baby, I can't go to school for you. You know, you got to go to school for 
you. You have to do the work. You have to. Now, I gotta be honest, she got some other dollars. Because when I was in school, that's really all I cared about. Just to be held out. I mean, it's what I cared about. So that and that's that's what helped me. But at the same time, there was an obstacle in the tenth grade where there was a school trip where the band went on. And if you didn't have a certain average, which I'm almost embarrassed to say now, if you didn't have a 77 average, you couldn't make that trip. And you had to have the 77 average by semester time, after the first two grading periods. Well, it didn't matter if you got it up to a 77 by the third one. If you didn't have it semester time, you weren't going. Mr. Charles Richburg, he's like a father figure to me now with my dad being gone. He didn't let me go, 10th grade. I had a 76.4. I had a 76.4 average in my classes. Now, it took him not letting me go, him caring enough about me to make me stay home. Although, undeniably, I was the best student he had. I had all the solos in the jazz band. I was supposed to be going to play the saxophone part in the jazz band, the tuba in the uh, concert band and the drums for the drum line competition. All three things and on three different sets of music for one school band. So I was per se a superstar in my own head. Because Mr. Richburg didn't let me go, that was the turnaround for me. That turned around for me because by the end of the year, instead of having a 76 point something, I had like a 91 point something. Going forward, I was a beast, beast student. For most part, just to be honest. I had A's, of course, but I had more so like a, at that time it was 193. I had like a 91, 92 or so. It was a, you know, B plus kind of thing, you know. That, though, allowed me, I tested well, and I did well on the uh, SAT, you know. So that allowed me to then secure a scholarship, come to school, graduate, live my dream. You know, support a family. You know, I told someone, you know, some people say, man, I don't see how you did it playing music. I said, well, you know, at one point, I was, per se, unemployed. I didn't have a day job. That horn there, at that time, paid my rent, bought my wife's engagement ring, paid my car note. I think that's all I had at the time. Yeah, I don't think I, don't think I had anything. So they paid my apartment rent, bought my car note, you know, did my car note, and bought my wife's engagement ring. Now I've got a family. I'm not going to lie. I've got a day job. Got to be back at 2 o'clock. You know, <laughs> I got three dependents, and, you know, insurance is not cheap for a skinny man. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I, I've had to, you know, I, I've had to, uh, you know, pick up a day job, but I'm, I'm still able to live out my dream. And hopefully, you know, you'll be able to do the same. You know, make the choices. Don't don't think that don't think that because you walk these halls that you know, oh God, I'm just going to class and I'm going to do this and I can't wait to get out of here. Make the most of the time while you're here. You know, take the time, engage yourself with others, engage yourself with things that would promote your your uh, your your betterment or your or your interest in your field. And then when it's time to leave here. <coughs> Have yourself prepared to go out and to do other things, to make your mark. You know, forge ahead and do the things that nobody thought you could do. You know, how many of us have at some point in time had somebody tell us that we couldn't do something that we really wanted to do or that we really wanted to make happen? Not sure hands. All right. How many people, at, at the same token, how many people proved them wrong? Now, how many people felt overly ecstatic about the fact that they had been able to do that? Is that not like one of the most rewarding feelings in the world? You know? Now, I would ask how many people went and rubbed it in their face, but I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Want to know. Want to know. But, <laughs> because I know it happens, you know? I know it happens. But, you know, I, I, I say all that, and I hope, I, I hope I've been able to say something to encourage you. The decisions we make are going to be, you know, not just for today. Decisions that we make on tomorrow, for the weeks, the days, the years to come. You know, whatever your field is, embrace it. It may change. I want to be a math major. 
Later I found out musicians are some of the best mathematicians. But, you know, my wife wouldn't say that. <laughs> she said I'm spending money all the time. But I tell her, it's not cheap to play these things. You gotta have reads, and, right? <laughs> you gotta have reads, and I don't need you to talk to her for You gotta have reads, you gotta have pad savers, you gotta have the equipment that comes out with you, you know, a small speaker that I use on the practice piano at home. You know, when I'm writing music or things like that, composing music, you know, gas, you know, I can't drive a small car. I'm not going to say why, but I can drive a small car, so I have to drive an SUV to take the gas and put in that. I got three daughters that have before school and after school. They got to have lunch money. They got to have all this that other. My wife works too. But we got two brand new, well, my truck is not brand new. It's just not paid off. Her truck is brand new. Due to an accident in December 4, that she could have been gone, but thank God she's still here. So you know we had to get a new car. So you know, but but it, it's 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 things that you know prepare yourself, prepare yourself for life. You know, enjoy the moment that you're in, but always know what your next step is. Always know what you what you intend to do next. Always know, always be a step ahead of where you are in your thinking. I tell people all the time, I always try to think outside the box. I tell my daughters all the time, I always try to think outside the box. You know, because as long as you think here, your mindset just simply stays there. It only stays there. As soon as you think about something that's over here, now you, you begin to prepare yourself and you make a plan or a decision. Okay, how am I going to get outside of here to get to it? So you have to plan your work, then you have to work your plan. All right? My plan was, and I told my mother, I said, Mom, I'm going to school, I want to be a musician. If it's up to me, I will play in graduate. What? I said, Mom, the way the music world works, if you're good enough to get picked up while you're in school, then you immediately leave. And you go, and you play, you play, you make as much money as you can, you make a name for yourself. Schools are always going to be there. It's what I say 20 years ago. 20 years ago. A little different now. But, you know, you, you have this opportunity now. You're here in school. How many, uh, you, how many are here and from here you want to go to work? Okay. As in, or, or are going to go to another institution? Okay. So, so, so that's work or to another, uh, to go to more school? More school? Okay. But you're preparing yourself now, right? So that means you can't think about just what's going on right here at Durham Tech, right? All right? That means you're kind of in the news for whatever your options are. You're kind of in the news listening to things that are going on at the university or campuses that you want to be able to attend, right? All right? That means that you're completing coursework and things now to have yourself in a better position to where if you have to apply to get that university between you and someone else, you're making sure that your grades are where you want them to be or the best that you could have them to be able to maybe edge out the next person. That's another thing. Life is competition. Some of it's friendly, and some of you just don't have friends. You know? Some of it, you, you, you can't go into it in a friend, as, a, as a friendly situation. Why? Because you don't know the next person that's coming from Virginia, from Texas, or wherever that wants the same spot to be able to enroll into a school as you do. But you also don't know what their background is, what their work ethic was, and all that. So you have to make sure that yours the best that you can have it, and hopefully it trumps that. Okay? And there are going to be some hiccups. There are going to be some hiccups. Everything is not a, everything is not a success. I've had some opportunities that I thought I was ready for. Didn't work out. You know, but I learned from them. And I'm able to put myself in a better position now to where I can do that. I had an opportunity to go and travel and play in Brazil, and uh, this was in 2012. And I wasn't able to do it, but remember I said everything happens for a reason. And I'm thankful that I wasn't able to do it because had I been able to do it, I would have gotten over somewhere in a foreign land and then had something happen to me that required emergency surgery from a doctor's appointment on December 11th, 2012. I went to the doctor's office. The doctor said, Mr. Miller, uh, this is what's going on. We need to put you in the emergency room and uh, operating room tomorrow morning. So had I been in Brazil, then I would have had that issue 
and then stuck with a Brazilian doctor or Brazilian medical team, which I know me, I would put it off and I'd be like, no, let me wait till I get home. There's no telling what kind of damage could have been done by me. You know. And at that time, my wife was pregnant with our third daughter. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. All opportunities are not opportunities to take. You have to weigh them out and see how it's going to impact you, not only in the moment that we're in, but down the road as well. There could be an opportunity that you have, but it's going to kill your character. That's not an opportunity to take. Because your character can be like credit. If someone can speak for you, you don't even necessarily have to be in the room. They can endorse you and have you an opportunity that you're technically not deserving of. Trust me, I know. I've played with people that people play a lifetime to play for or play with. I've studied with Brandon Marsalis, who lives here in Durham, but I've studied with him where he's upward of $100 or $150 a lesson, and that's just one hour. Thankfully, I had a, you know, we, we built a report, and he was like, oh man, just come by the house and, you know, let's hang out. You know, and to have somebody of that caliber to say, hey man, you gotta go home. That's all right. You know, to have that endorsement. To have somebody call me, a, a, a club owner or a restaurant owner, and say, hey man, uh, I got your number from Mr. Marsalis, Bradford. He told me to call you. He said, you'd be a good fit to come in and play music or not, then I. You know, so I'm sitting on the phone trying not to act like those cool girls. <laughs> you know, like, you serious? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, but, but just, you know, that, that's, that's better than, I mean, that's just as good as credit. You know? Your credit can buy you things that your money can't right now. You know? So, and, and it's all about how you prepare. It's about a decision. It was your decision not to get the credit card that they were offering, you know, in my case, that, that they were offering in the student union when you went in to check your mail. This is where they get a lot of us. You know, it was a decision not to do that. For you, it's, you know, your credit is because you decided not to go get that new car just because you got the money to get it right then. You know, we make decisions that are going to help us not only today, but later on in life. I made mine. I'm content with mine, for the most part. The only decision I really honestly, honestly regret in life, the one decision I regret in life, and you all gonna laugh, but I tell you, it's the most honest thing I'm here to tell you. The one decision I regret in life is that I used to eat any and everywhere I do. And you can see what that did to me. <laughs> but I'm serious, I'm serious. I would go out right after school, I'd go grab me something to eat, then I'd come home and eat a full day. And then I may say, well, mom, I'm going to go over to such and such house, whatever. And I get there, and they're like, hey, man, you eat? Yeah, I had a little something. <laughs> oh, man, come on. So I did it. You know, I did it. That's my only regret. Honestly, that's my, that's my only regret. I don't regret not doing football because I later on played football, even after college. I didn't play in college, but on full music scholarship, I then played semi-professional ball here in Durham, for Raleigh Durham Wolverine for three years until I tore up my knee. That's a whole other story. But decisions. Decisions prepare us not only for today, not only for tomorrow, but for years to come. All right? So regardless of the circumstances that may have us in any place that we are in right then in life, if it's not already killed us, it's something we can learn from, and we have to learn from it and progress on it. All right? Hopefully I've said something to encourage you. Hopefully I've said something to make you think. Hopefully I've play some music that you enjoy. If this is your first time hearing jazz, I hope you like it. Go check it out. You know, there's music around the area, you know, most local spots. The BU Cafe downtown Durham. I play there uh, every now and again. Uh, there are other places. There's Alley 26. There's, you know, a couple different places for music. You know, Raleigh, there's Sea Grace, there's Irregardless, you know, all kinds of places. You know, that you can check out the Independent Weekly or you can go to jazzentertainmentonline.com and it tells you where the music is at Rob's and Steakhouse and Olivia's and all that good stuff. So hopefully you'll support the local jazz community and local jazz musicians. And, uh, that's about it for me right this minute. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you.
One more song for real. For real. <laughs> okay. Um, Some people didn't get to hear you. Like what? You don't know? Jazz. Jazz. My favorite.
Miller, another round of applause. Woo! Thank you so much. Well, this is the end of the uh, presentation here. Uh, feel free to grab some drinks, and if we have any more popcorn, grab some more popcorn. No more popcorn? No more popcorn. So, just drinks. All right? Thank you again, Mr. Miller.